delighted to welcome Delegate LaCherise Aird to This Week in Virginia. Delegate Aird's been a member of the General Assembly since 2016, representing Petersburg, Dinwiddie, and a part of the county of Chesterfield. A Virginia State University graduate, and in fact, her university awarded her a Doctor of Humane Letters, an honorary degree, and that's quite an honor for someone young in their career. Uh, but we appreciate your being on. We could talk about some of your bills because you have some interesting bills that have moved along on public health emergency and racial and ethnic uh, uh, impact statements of criminal justice, but really wanted to focus in on a resolution, uh, not the one on access to water, it seems to be flying on through as well, but the one that's on racism, uh, calling on the General Assembly to recognize racism as a public health crisis. Tell our viewers that it's passed the House. It'll be going to the Senate. And we want to, to hear about this resolution. Um, let me start just with the broad question about what really prompted you to introduce this resolution. You know, the one thing that we have recognized here in our Commonwealth well before now um, are the adverse circumstances of our, um, our varied racial history and the impact that that has in present day. Um, and quite frankly, uh, our Commonwealth is not an anomaly in that regard. Um, but what happened during the start of this pandemic, uh, once it was uh, well underway and impacting uh, Virginians all around the state, that we saw an exacerbation of the impact on the black and brown people um, in the Commonwealth relative to health outcomes. Um, I will also say that the same challenges that we've seen these communities already dealing with, we just saw them to a much worse extent as a result of the pandemic. But if I go back even further and you think about this idea around racism and the impact that racism has, you will note that our special session where I first introduced this resolution was right on the heels of significant social unrest, both in the, in the Commonwealth, but then also around our country. Um, social unrest that was the result of racism in our criminal justice system. If you think about an issue that I've also been fighting for for at least the last three years, which is the crisis around the disproportionate impact that uh, black women, brown women are experiencing relative to maternal mortality. The basis um, based on the data of that disparity is a result of racism in our healthcare system. I can probably offer examples in housing, uh, in education relative to inequitable school division lines, uh, all across the board there are instances of racism that are directly impacting um, black and brown people in all systems of government and all systems um, and in all instances of our institutions. So I felt that the special session, much like what we had been seeing occur, I can't take credit that I came up with it, uh, but in many other states as a recommendation of the American Public Health Association, uh, in my mind, I felt like it was time for our Commonwealth to do so as well, um, especially given our history uh, as ground zero, quite frankly, um, as the home of the Confederacy. You know, is part of the challenge, the difference between, I would say personal racism and systemic racism or sometimes institutional racism or other expressions because I, I missed the, the rules committee when the bill was reported out and, and all and I noticed that it passed the house on a party line vote and I would not be one personally to judge every member who voted against it saying they're personally racist but uh, is the challenge for some of us in the general population, among particularly among the white population, and understanding what is systemic racism. And that's what you really are addressing. Uh, David, you have really, what's the saying? Uh, 
hit the hammer, the nail right over the head, you know, uh, whatever that reference is. But ultimately, based on conversations that I have had, as well as feedback I have received since the passing of the resolution, there is a significant misunderstanding of the word racism. And I believe because we don't have these conversations often enough, that when you begin to say the word racism directly, it feels very personal. And it puts someone on the defense um, without the agreed understanding of what racism is and personal racism versus systemic racism, and even the proxies that exist for racism that have nothing to do with you as an individual, we will continue to bump into, quite frankly, um, an inability to move forward. Because if we can't have an open and honest conversation about the reality that exists, I mean, this is pure data based then how can we have open hearts and minds enough to repair uh, and relay the foundation on these very systems that we are talking about? Because these systems are filled with people that actually execute on the tasks that make up the operation that these systems employ. So, so your point from the resolution is that the healthcare and, and as you said, you could talk about other things, employment, education, many other different subjects, but the health care in the Commonwealth, and, and some might say in the nation, in fact, I think it may be something that an executive order that President Biden has just issued that may be addressing some portion of this, that, that systemic racism is there. It may not be my personal racism, but it's systemic. So dig into that a little bit more to, to help our viewers. I would say most of the people watching the show would say, I'm not a racist. And, and, and I, I think it's important to know that I don't think the Commonwealth is, by passing this resolution, I don't think the Commonwealth is aiming to identify or affirm individuals, people as racist, right? That's not at all what this is about. And quite frankly, if anyone takes even half a second to read the resolution, you will see that what we describe here are the very systems. I mean, we talk about education, employment, housing. We talk about all of those systems and institutions. And even in, and I think it's important for me to make this point, baseline foundational recommendations um, to be made, the, the five that are offered, they speak to not only our understanding of what systemic racism is, so that we're all operating from the same uh, baseline, under, baseline and agreed upon understanding, um, but the actions that it is recommending is specifically about the systems. It's not about people. I think those are critical conversations that we should one day have, but this resolution is not about personal and or individual racism. That's not what this is. Um, and, and so I, I think that by passing this resolution, it's ultimately a first step. It is not intended to be a, a capture all that if you pass this resolution, oh, this is going to fix the racism that exists. That's not what this is intended to do, not how it was structured. Um, it is literally a foundational step. I encourage people to read it. It's HJ 537. They can find it. We'll, we'll put something up on the, on the screen to help them go on the LIS system where they can find it. And then right at the end, you have a resolved and a resolved further and a resolved finally. And your first resolve has calling on the General Assembly to, to recognize that racism is public health crisis. And then talk about some about the second one that really has, you might say, it's a bit more specifics about uh, relevant state entities. What, what would you ho hope would happen as a result of, of this resolution? You know, I, always, I oftentimes make this reference that uh, 
um, elected officials, we pass policy, but the people with the real power are the, bureau the bureaucrats. They outlive administrations, they outlive legislators, uh, they outlive the elected officials. And so those bureaucrats can be the difference between whether a policy is executed in the way that we desired and not, and quite frankly, if they even want to do it. And so this second uh, resolved clause speaks to the agency reference specifically is the Virginia Department of Health and Office of um, Health Equity. It names that specific agency. And so in this instance, we are asking them to please look at the challenges that we are experiencing in this system, in these systems and institutions through the lenses of racism. After we acknowledge and affirm that this exists, as we are exploring solutions, we have to deliberately look at uh, the options that we have to consider through the lenses of recognizing the barrier of racism has existed in our um, uh, previous policies, previous practices, and the only way to now overcome those um, are to look at, did we structure that in the right way, knowing that racism is something that is inherently part of this institution and the systems that we utilize? Um, and so that is everything to do with what that, uh, that, that second resolve statement means. And we're hopeful that by exploring uh, both health systems and agencies, housing, transportation, by exploring those institutions, we then get to some of these root causes that will result in specific recommendations that actually eradicate uh, this bias that we say exists right now. That that's where the real work and outcome will come from. You know, I would I would encourage our viewers if if they have not done any reading on systemic racism, they could go on any search engine, Google or whatever, and put it in and you would find all sorts of interesting documents. You'd find the U.S. Catholic bishops statement that was made recently. You'd find a very thoughtful piece in USA Today. You would find, as I did, Ben and Jerry's. Ben, ben and Jerry's has a fantastic section in which they talk about the different ways that you can recognize and you can see systemic racism in the United States. And so, I mean, do some, do some research. Don't be uh, afraid of the word uh, and, don't realize, and recognize that, it's, as, as you're saying, Delegate Aird, it's not pointing a finger at, at an individual and saying, David, you're a racist or senator or delegate or anyone. It's really saying that we, we live in a society that uh, racism is, is rampant. Angel, uh, you were telling me something about Northern Virginia and where you have grown up and now senior at VCU. Have you uh, a, a question that you would like to, to ask Delegate Aird? So growing up in Northern Virginia, I don't think I was really, I was really made aware of the systematic racism until I came to Richmond. So what do you suggest that, how, do, how can people of color address systematic racism and go about it? This is actually a really difficult question, surprisingly enough, because if I'm really honest with you and your viewers, I would say, um, unless you are, I would say there are instances where you are exposed to blatant, direct racism that you feel it, you hear it, and you see it, and you know it for exactly what it is. In 2021, I don't know that the personal racism um, that is expressed is oftentimes as direct as that. There are a lot of proxies for racism. There are a lot of uh, beneath the surface references and phrases to, ref to racism that you don't immediately recognize and identify when it occurs if you're just not accustomed to those experiences. Um, I often say uh, and push back against people who, who, who have said to me on more than one occasion, why do you need to talk about racism? 
Why do you need to talk about black people ind independently? You know, we are all X, Y, and Z. But if I'm not talking about it, who is, right? Like if I'm not talking about the experience that I have or that I have seen other black and brown people around me have, how do you have the privilege of knowing how your behaviors or actions or even uh, approaches have impacted me? And so I think that this conversation is really not just the responsibility of black or brown people um, or minorities general, because right now we're talking about, you know, racism broadly. Um, but I do believe communication needs to occur, not allowed to fester and grow, but to sometimes humble yourself in such a way to make someone aware that might not otherwise be of how their words, actions, or approaches that fall into the category of racism um, are affecting you, have affected you, um, or affecting someone else. And I strongly believe that if we had more conversations like these, uh, talking about policies such as a resolution, which is symbolic in nature, but also um, critical, um, it would be less uncomfortable um, and, and less uh, of putting someone in a position of defensiveness. You know, a Angel's question prompts me to have one for you. And that is, if you live in an area where you don't see that much personal racism, then can it possibly make you be less aware of the systemic racism that's there? Absolutely. But this is also the reason why uh, as a, I feel older at 34, but I guess that's still kind of young, but that's why I can say it's so important for us to know our history. Um, it's so important for civic classes and government classes, and I've advocated for this in the past, because if you have that foundational understanding, you recognize things when it's in front of you. But without that, you can be blind to some of uh, the present day and quite frankly, perpetual cycle of actions that have occurred uh, or and are occurring. And so I think you have to start there. And it really is our responsibility to make sure every citizen that is being raised up from our youngest students to our you know, uh, high school students and onward to college, that they are exposed and have a general uh, level of awareness when it comes to this, because that is absolutely what happens. Uh, it will occur and you will not be prepared to recognize it. Uh, and you can't correct it if you can't recognize it. Yes, uh, I, I love that expression. And I, I found a sentence in one of the articles on in the USA Today that talks about if you want to change something, the causes that matter are the ones you could fix. And that one's worth thinking about because it's, you know, there are multiple causes, but what are the, the causes that we can fix? Well, I would, I would certainly hope that your resolution moves us in the direction of conversations. And it's great talking with you. It's great to have Angel Miner who's been an intern with us now, part-time staffer, and helping to uh, helping with this week in Virginia uh, to have the conversation. And uh, we we pledge to try to reach out to others to ha have the conversation with them as well. So before our time ends, and I know you have a meeting coming up, uh, give us any of your closing thoughts, please. Thank you so much again for this opportunity to have what I consider to be a critical conversation. Um, one of the first things that was said to me when this resolution passed out of the Rules Committee was that, you know, this was a feel good measure and that it would amount to nothing for the most part mm -hmm. and that it was unnecessary. And I just want to say to anyone who has that perspective that I, I not only strongly disagree. But again, I would say that this is a first step. Again, I encourage people to go and read the resolution and see what we're trying to do from a foundation building um, place. 
Uh, we have a lot more work to do uh, outside of what is listed in this resolution, but it has to start with us affirming that this is the reality in our Commonwealth, within our systems and within our institutions. And I hope that together we can work collectively to rebuild and strengthen um, these things moving forward. So just thank you again for the opportunity to participate and to have this, uh, this dialogue. Thank you, Delar, Delegate Lacherice Aird for being on this week in Virginia. And we look forward to following this resolution and following then the work that takes place after that. So thank you very much and stay safe and stay strong. Thank you. Thank you.